Manchester Longevity focused on evidence-based fundamentals rather than complicated protocols. Four categories, lifestyle foundations, supplements and uh, prescription drugs, regenerative medicine, and finally, blood markers. Estrogen therapy, yeah. both for women and men. Essential blood markers to track for aging. Longevity lightning round, CoQ10. Um, uh, I, probably 75 to 80% of longevity is environmentally determined. So that's a big piece of the puzzle. Stem cells, peptides, exosomes, and PRP. Which of these yeah. interventions has the most promising? Which one needs more evidence? I think they're all promising and all need more evidence. What is the supplement that has, has the most hype and the least evidence? <laughs> oh boy. Are you overwhelmed by endless longevity supplements promising to extend your life? Today, we will separate science from expensive hype. Welcome to Outsmart Your Genes, where science-based strategies help you shape your genetic destiny for a healthier, longer life. I am Dr. Lucia Aronica, lecturer in epigenetics and nutrigenomics at Stanford University. While this podcast is independent from my academic work, it shares the same mission, transforming complex science into actionable strategies for optimal health. Today's episode is a true longevity masterclass that will change the way you think about aging. I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Matt Kaberlein, a world expert in aging research. Matt is CEO of OptiSpan, driving innovations in personalized and preventative medicine, and an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. As a co-founder of the Dog Aging Project and author of over 20 scientific papers, he's a distinguished leader in aging research, recognized by the NIH and multiple prestigious organizations for his contributions to longevity science. We will explore five key areas of longevity research. First, lifestyle foundations for healthy longevity. Second, supplements and prescription drugs. Third, regenerative medicine from stem cells to peptides. Fourth, key blood biomarkers to track as we age. And finally, we will end with a longevity lightning round where Dr. Kaberlein will evaluate today's most discussed longevity supplements and interventions, sharing his opinion on what works and what doesn't. So make sure to stick until the end. And if you want more science-based content on health and longevity, make sure to subscribe. And now, let's welcome Dr. Matt Kaberlein. Hi, Matt. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Yeah, you are, you are um, a guest speaker in uh, one of my Stanford lectures and uh, your message uh, deeply resonated with my approach to health and longevity focused on evidence-based fundamentals rather than complicated protocols. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to join these insights today with a wider audience. I have received many questions from my um, subscribers um, and I've divided them into four categories. Um, lifestyle foundations, supplements and uh, prescription drugs, uh, regenerative medicine, and finally uh, blood markers, markers okay. to track as we age. But before we start, can you share um, with us a little more about your background and uh, your current role at OptiSpan? Sure, ha happy to. So. Um, my background is really trained as a basic scientist. So I spent about 20 years 
um, working at the University of Washington as a professor, performing basic research on the biological mechanisms of aging. And so in that research, I used a variety of different animal models um, from very simple organisms like single cell budding yeast to nematode worms to mice. Um, and then also about 10 years ago, started something called the Dog Aging Project, which is also focused on understanding the biology of aging, but in companion dogs living in the real world with their owners. And so that I felt was an important extension of my basic research, given that dogs really share the human environment in a way that very few other animals do. And, and as we know, probably 75 to 80% of longevity is environmentally determined. So that's a big piece of the, the puzzle. Um, and so I've been really interested in aging throughout my entire career for many reasons, but one of the important reasons being that age is the greatest risk factor for almost every major cause of death and disability in all developed nations. And so if we can understand that biology um, and eventually do something about it, that gives us a much greater opportunity to improve health, health span, hopefully longevity for as many people and as many animals as we possibly can. Um, so about a year and a half, two years ago now, I left my academic primary appointments. I'm still involved in the Dog Aging Project. I um, still have a, a affiliate role at the University of Washington, but I've really shifted much closer to real application of um, what I would call health span medicine. So I'm now CEO of a company called Optispan. Optispan is kind of a mashup of optimal and health span. And our overarching mission is to um, create tools, technology, approaches, clinical care to give as many people as possible the best opportunities to maximize their health. So I would really characterize this as a healthcare technology company. Certainly a big part of that is, is framed around my academic career in that the biology of aging is one of the major determinants of health for people, but also much of this is now um, focused on given the tools that we have today, the knowledge that we have today, what can we do from a practical perspective? A lot of it's lifestyle, some of it's supplements, some of it's prescription medications, some of it's diagnostics and advanced approaches from a medical perspective. What can we do in that whole package to really give people the opportunity to have the highest quality of health for as long as possible? That's very really exciting. And uh, I think we are going to uh, answer many of the of the questions around <laughs> these topics uh, today. So let's let's dive in. Um, so starting with the lifestyle interventions, what are the, the lifestyle pillars for healthy aging? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, lots of people have different pillars, but I, what we've settled on at Optispan and what I think encompasses in a, a pragmatic and easy to understand way are really four pillars of health span. So we like active words. So we go with eat, move, sleep and connect. So eat is, of course, around nutrition. Um, move is exercise and physical activity. Sleep is sort of self-explanatory sleep quality um, and connect encapsulates both sort of your, your personal wellness, your personal mindfulness, and also this really important component of human connection. And I would actually put, I'm a big companion animal dog person, I would put companion animals in the connect pillar as well. So, you know, the connection that we have with other living beings, the relationships that really are the foundation for what makes life most meaningful. I think most of us would agree with that. So those are the four pillars that I would put under, um, largely under lifestyle and largely in the realm of there are things that we can do in each of those pillars to um, give ourselves the best opportunity for maximizing health span. I'm so glad you included the connect pillar. I think here in the U.S., uh, it's uh, often neglected. I'm from Italy, um, so I certainly mm, even see in my own life this uh, shift from, uh, you know, I used, I used to be more connected in, in everything, yeah. in, uh, you know, eating with, uh, with my family, and uh, I certainly miss that. I feel more isolated, and sometimes isolation helps with being productive, right? Because you disconnect from the world, and uh, you get more 
things done, uh, but uh, we forget about um, yeah that connection is really the 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 what is nurturing even our motivation uh, in in ways that we we forget. So I, I think that's I think that's absolutely right, and I, and certainly there are cultural com components. Um, I think also you know it's certainly from my personal perspective and my academic career of the four, the one that I thought the least about, because it's harder from a scientific perspective to study connection, right? And we don't have the same quantitative tools, we don't have the same biomarkers available. I have done a full, you know, 360 in the last couple of years. And I personally think that um, is probably, I mean, they're all important and all of the pillars are interconnected, but I think for many people, that's the one where there's the largest opportunity for improvement um, because it's the one that that often doesn't get talked about and gets neglected yes and if i can also mention uh you know i have a, a, a very uh, close relationship with my mom and she's for me a, a longevity queen she's <laughs> 84 years old and she's just shines health and happiness although yeah. She, you know, her nutrition, exercise, <laughs> she never exercised in her life. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but she's a, she, if you, if you look at the picture from my mom, you feel happy. Yeah, she radiates happiness. And I think that pillar is disproportionately expressed in her life and was sure, uh, certainly played a major role uh, in how well she's aging. And I hope I will age uh, like my mom. <laughs> so uh, let's move on uh, with the, um, a very discussed topic. So protein, optimal protein, how much? Yeah and which source. We know that many longevity experts uh, think of protein as something that is, uh, um, you know, promoting um, potentially anti-aging pathways and TOR and so on. But on the other hand, we know that as we age, we become more frail and we need likely more protein. So what, what, your, right. what is your stance and uh, how much and which source of protein as we age should we provide? Yeah, so I'm gonna start kind of kind of high level. I think we can get in the weeds on the science if, if you want to, and it's, it's complicated and important for sure. Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of big picture things I would say. Um, so one is, uh, I think diet quality really matters when you're talking about protein. I, my reading of the sort of overall literature, uh, especially the human epidemiology, is that a lot of the confusion around high protein and health outcomes occurs because many of the studies are carried out in people who are eating a low quality diet and typically overeating in calories. So in my view, in that context, high protein is pretty bad. So if you have a relatively high protein diet and you're overfed and it's a low quality diet, meaning lots of processed foods, I think high protein can lead to higher risks for cancer and cardiovascular disease and kidney dysfunction. Um, the question is, if you are focused on nutrition, eating a quality diet, eating an appropriate amount of calories for your physical activity and your stature, in that context, I think high protein all things being equal, is less problematic and probably has some real benefits associated with it, particularly when combined with resistance training, so consistent resistance training to maintain and build lean mass. So you were alluding to this, as we get older, we tend to lose lean mass, lose muscle function, increase in fat, and that is associated with frailty, higher inflammation, higher metabolic dysfunction. So if we can maintain muscle mass as we get older, that's optimal from both a functional perspective, bone density and, and metabolic health. And the way to do that is to make sure that you're eating enough protein and practicing resistance training. So I think it's, a, it's an integrated strategy where you really need to focus on the quality of the diet, exercise, and I would argue resistance training as a part of the exercise regimen. In that context, high protein, in my view, is probably better than trying to restrict protein. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think we, we need uh, we need this information because also the guidelines are uh, really there only to supporting survival for supporting right. survival. The RDA. They are yeah. Yes, the, R, yeah, the RDA are really based only to maintaining uh, the nitrogen balance. So <laughs> uh, yeah. rather than probably we should shoot, I think, uh, twice as much as the guidelines 
probably 1.6 gram per kilo of body weight uh, seems to be probably a good place to start. And do you have any opinions of animal versus plant uh, based I don't, sources? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So first of all, I think, again, I didn't say it explicitly, but it was sort of wrapped up in that answer and, and your comment on it, which is that there, is a, there isn't a one size fits all, right? So it, it, the, the optimal amount of protein First of all, it's hard to define, but also is going to be different depending on your situation. What are you eating? How much are you eating? How active are you? How old are you? Um, but yeah, I think that guideline of, you know, it, it works out to somewhere between like 0.6 and one gram of protein per day per pound of body fat, or you can do the calculation to kilogram ballpark. Yeah. If you're in that range, you're probably okay. Um, so plant versus animal, I'm not convinced there's a, there's a real difference when you control for all of the other stuff I already talked about, diet quality, how much people are eating, are they active and doing resistance training? I'm not convinced that the source of the protein per se is all that important. I could be wrong, so I'm open to being convinced, but I haven't seen anything in the literature that I find really compelling. Again, many of the studies that will say, you know, animal protein is better than, than or plant protein is better than animal protein have a lot of problems in this population that they studied in that that makes it hard for that to really back that interpretation up. So I will say I'm, I'm not I'm not somebody who advocates for a carnivore diet. Like I do think that a, that for most people, the best option is a diet that's rich in vegetables um, and some fruits. So eating enough plants for most people is a good idea. I just don't think there's any reason to say that you should get all of your protein from plants and never eat meat just based on the protein piece. It doesn't, I haven't seen anything that's all that convincing in my view. Exactly. And I think uh, the problem might be that it makes it difficult to actually reach the optimal um, amount of protein if you're only eating a plant-based diet. Yeah. Unless you supplement, it's possible. And uh, mm -hmm. so, which brings me to the next question uh, for those needing supplementation. Uh, which is better, like whey protein or protein powder, plant-based uh, for, for vegetarians or vegan, or uh, essential amino acids? Yeah, again, I don't have a strong opinion. And honestly, this isn't an area where I've done a lot of research. So I will say my, my lack of strong opinion may be based somewhat from ignorance, but my intuition is um, it probably doesn't make a huge difference. Again, my feeling is, look, the way I think about this is, there are things that definitely move the needle, and then there's all this other stuff that you can worry about. And I, I think eating a high quality diet, avoiding processed foods, you know, eat, not overeating, way more important than worrying about your protein powder, in my personal opinion. So that's where I'm going to put my energy. Yeah, I think so. I share your same opinions and, and, and I appreciate, I know that this is not your specialty, but I appreciate uh, <laughs> your willingness to share your opinion. I also think, you know, just again, bringing up my mom again, I suggest, I, I told her to, um, um, uh, I hired the trainer for her, so strength training right. and, yeah. uh, and protein supplementation because she doesn't eat enough. Um, so in, that, in her case, and I, in her case, I suggested whey protein rather than essential amino acids, just because she needs the whole, uh, to build muscle, you need the whole chain. I think essential amino acids may be an option for those who already get a lot of protein, for example, for plant protein, uh, which tends to be lower in essential amino acids. And so then you can just round up and uh, have right. those essential amino But again, I'm also not expert, an expert in the field, but... Okay. Yeah. Well, now, let, let me clarify as well. Okay. Like, I did, didn't want to give the impression that I'm saying nobody should supplement with with protein powders. Um, if if you need to do that in order to hit your protein goal, absolutely do that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think the question of essential amino acids versus versus whey protein or or some sort of plant protein mix that is, you know, that has everything in it makes that makes more sense to me as well. So um, I don't know who would necessarily benefit from essential amino acids or branch chain amino acid 
mixes per se. Yeah, I think brand chain amino acids are mostly debunked, especially for... <laughs> and yeah, uh, lots of people yeah. are still taking them. <laughs> yeah, but apparently the science is, uh, is out. Uh, but the essential amino acids, again, I, I see them uh, some, some, some people who work out and are in calorie restriction and just use them, but they are already uh, maxing out on yeah. the protein yeah. and they use the essential amino acids to keep the uh, some uh, you know the, the, some muscle protein synthesis going while being calorie restricted anyway these are again things that don't move the needle for most people um so then fasting uh, yeah. for longevity what is your uh, what is your stance uh, yeah so i mean again i think the literature is pretty clear for longevity that um, fasting itself in the absence of caloric restriction doesn't really do anything for longevity in laboratory animals. We don't know the answer in people. But having said that, I do think fasting is a useful strategy for some people to, uh, main, to, to, to maintain an appropriate level of caloric consumption. It's easier for some people not to overeat if they practice intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. There is some evidence that time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting can improve insulin sensitivity. So in people who are on the road to diabetes, pre-diabetic, um, it may be the case that there is additional value from intermittent fasting, uh, time-restricted eating in terms of metabolic health, in terms of maybe starting to reverse some of that metabolic dysfunction. But from a purely longevity perspective, looking at the animal studies in the laboratory, there's not much evidence that other than the caloric restriction effect that fasting has added benefits for longevity. Yeah, I also think I also share the same opinion. I think in in, 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 in when calorie restriction is beneficial and it's not for all all aging uh, people, uh, then fasting is a tool in the toolbox. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, but especially for frail people, it can make it even more difficult to to get your protein and yeah. So the final question in the longevity bucket, in uh, the lifestyle bucket, um, exercise. W what, why it is so powerful for uh, healthy aging? What are the cellular benefits? Yeah, so I mean, we know exercise does a lot. I don't know that we know all of the mechanisms in terms of why exercise is associated with so many health benefits beyond, I think one of the things that I, that's worth appreciating is all of these pillars tie into the network of interactions that, that we understand to modulate the biology of aging. So I think the reason why eating a healthy diet, exercising, getting good quality sleep, having strong human relationships improves your health across a bunch of domains, reduces your risk of a bunch of different diseases. It's because these things do modulate the biology of aging. Having said that, we don't know all the mechanisms. So what we do know exercise does, a few things that are probably contributing is it improves mitochondrial function. So mitochondria are of course, you know, people call the powerhouses of the cell. Um, so it improves mitochondrial function, reduces inflammation. And then I think we're learning that there are a whole variety of hormones that get secreted when we exercise that can go throughout the body and have positive, um, effects on a bunch of other tissues and organs. Um, related to that, exercise helps maintain bone density as we get older. It helps, obviously, if you're doing resistance training, um, maintain or even increase lean mass or muscle mass, which again is important for a whole bunch of stuff. You need your muscles to function. They're also a really important metabolic organ in terms of maintaining glucose homeostasis and metabolic function. So there's a whole bunch of effects from exercise. And I think, you know, different types of exercise can have greater or lesser effects in some of these domains. But interestingly, pretty much any exercise um, can have beneficial effects, you know, as long as it's not taken too far or too extremes. Yeah. And, and exercise also activates autophagy, which is one of the benefits of fasting. But apparently, uh, to my understanding, I think people who exercise have, uh, uh, you know, go uh, uh, have, uh, autophagy. Uh, so autophagy is one of actually of the of, of the mechanisms mediating the adaptation to exercise. So um, it's uh, and uh, even people who exercise and fast 
So they enter, they activate autophagy like much faster because many people ask how, much, how, how long does it take to activate autophagy when you fast? Yeah. It depends. Actually, if you are exercising, it's so much quicker. So, um, yeah. Uh, now, let's move to supplements uh, and prescription drugs. What is um, the supplement that has, has the most hype and least evidence? <laughs> oh boy. I, yeah, I don't know that I could say the one that has the most hype. Um, I mean, the one that I have, I have been most directly involved in, um, to some extent, debunking is resveratrol. And again, I'm not going to say that resveratrol doesn't do anything for anybody. It, it probably does. But I think a lot of the initial excitement and certainly the mechanisms that were proposed for resveratrol have turned out not to be real. Um, so that's certainly one. But I mean, there's a bunch that are, you know, that are hyped to different degrees. And I think the the, the challenge is it's very difficult ever to prove that a particular supplement doesn't have any benefit, right? Because what does that what does that even mean? How would you go about how would you go about proving that? So um you know, I think where, where I sort of, the way I look at it is what, what are the things that we're sure in at least a significant fraction of people will have benefits and start there. And then you can, you know, go down the list and it becomes less and less clear. And then you can ask what's the kind, what's the type of evidence that we're using to be confident in our view that a particular supplement is likely to benefit a particular individual. Then it becomes sort of a one a case-by-case -case basis, because some things we can measure, right? And we can supplement to deficiencies. I personally think that's a stronger argument if you can measure it and you can see that you as an individual are below average or outside of a range that we feel confident um, is associated with some benefits, as opposed to something where we can't really measure it. We don't really have any way to know if it's working. It's harder to get confidence that a particular supplement is going to benefit. An yeah, so true. And very often the best supplements is the one we are deficient of. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, with this approach, what is the most promising intervention? Well, I mean, I think, so I don't know if, I don't know about promising. I think that the ones that I think of when I talk about supplementing defi deficiencies are things like omega-3 or vitamin D, where, you know, we know a significant fraction of the population is outside of what we think is the optimal range. We have ways to measure it and we can kind of titrate to what we think is the optimal range. So that's one bucket. Um, in the longevity, those, and I wouldn't necessarily say those are longevity supplements, per se, but certainly they're involved in health and probably can affect longevity for some people. In the longevity space where things have been studied for their effects on lifespan or sometimes health span in laboratory animals, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a harder, it's a harder space to really have a ton of confidence in because there's not a lot that has been reproducible you know, in multiple studies in multiple labs. So the things that I think are talked about and interesting, and there's some evidence to support, you know, would be things like um, alpha ketoglutarate or urolithin A, spermidine is kind of interesting. Um, NAD precursors get a lot of attention. The, the data is uh, sort of mixed. So certainly there are some studies showing positive benefits in laboratory animals, some that haven't been reproducible. So there's a set of probably 10 or 12 things in that bucket where people are taking them because they have heard that they can promote longevity, but it's not completely clear from the animal studies how effective these things are or how, what fraction of individuals are likely to benefit from their use. I see. And now talking about rapamycin, you are really probably the world expert on this topic and you have been using rapamycin yourself. So what are the benefits, risks and dosing? Sure. So again, if we, I think we have to separate what we know from laboratory animal studies from what we think might be true in the real world. So in laboratory animals, and I'm going to talk particularly about mice because that's where we have the most data in a mammal. We know rapamycin increases lifespan. And this is where I would say rapamycin is kind of fundamentally different from those other supplements that I mentioned in the sense that it's been tested at least a dozen times, a dozen different labs. Everybody gets it to work. There's really no question that in laboratory animals, rapamycin works robustly, as far as I know, every time people have tested it. So it increases lifespan and it seems to delay and in some cases reverse functional declines across many different tissues and organs in the body. So again, 
in mice, I think the places that are most interesting would be the immune system, the ovaries, the oral cavity, um, the heart, uh, and the brain, where we've actually seen you can take mice that are aged, show dysfunction, declines in function, start treating them with rapamycin, and you actually see improvements in function in those, those organs and tissues. So, so it's pretty clear in laboratory animals that rapamycin consistently slows aging, increases lifespan, and multiple health span metrics. Some evidence in dogs for improvements in heart function, improvements in activity. We don't know yet whether it extends lifespan in dogs. Um, no real evidence for significant side effects in dogs uh, at the doses that it's been tested. Um, and then in people, it's a kind of a different beast because rapamycin was first developed as an organ transplant drug. So that's how it was FDA approved. There's a lot of data on people taking high doses, daily doses of rapamycin to prevent organ transplant rejection. In that context, there's a pretty long list of side effects. The things that are probably most concerning are uh, risks of uh, decline, depressed immune function. So increased risk of infection, particularly bacterial infections. Mouth sores is the most common side effect. In the organ transplant patients, these are pretty severe mouth sores, um, high triglycerides, impaired glucose homeostasis. Those are the big ones that I think most transplant docs would watch out for and be worried about. We can compare that to the larger or smaller but growing body of literature on people taking rapamycin off-label, meaning their physician may prescribe it, but not for organ transplant rejection, but because there's some reason to believe that it might help them in their specific situation, often autoimmunity, sometimes specific types of heart dysfunction, or because they think it's going to improve their lifespan or health span. Usually this is uh, once weekly dosing around six milligrams, but the range is pretty big, anywhere from say two milligrams once a week to some people up to 20 milligrams once a week. In that context, we have a lot of data for benefits. The things that seem like they might be real are improvements in vaccine response, um, maybe decreased risk of viral infections or at least uh, uh, negative consequences like long COVID from viral infections that are probably inflammatory uh, mediated. A lot of different autoimmune conditions or age-related inflammatory conditions seem to be helped by rapamycin in certain people. And then again, some cases of certain types of heart disease. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy in particular, there are a fair number of case reports now where people have taken rapamycin and seem to see some improvements. Is it increasing lifespan? I, we're not gonna know for a long time. Um, and I think, you know, which people are benefiting, who are the responders and the non-responders, I think is also uh, an open question. There's a little bit of a hint in, particularly in women, that, and this just came out of the, the PEARL trial, um, uh, that there may be improvements in body composition, maintenance of lean mass, maybe some declines in visceral adipose. Again, one, one trial, not a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial, so we'll be a little bit careful not to overinterpret that information, but I've heard anecdotal reports from other people that it's easier to maintain lean mass and potentially lose fat mass when taking rapamycin. Very interesting. Those were premenopausal or postmenopausal women? Uh, I think it was both. So this this Pearl trial, there's a preprint out. So if people are interested, it's it's called the Pearl trial. It's from um, Ageless Rx was the sponsor. This was a, a again not a not a like randomized double blind placebo controlled clinical trial. It was placebo controlled. It, it, I think it was actually randomized, but it was like a participatory trial distributed. People would get the drug sent to them and then, you know, complete surveys and take DEXAs. And I think it was a it was a mixed population of ages, but probably mostly postmenopausal, I'm guessing, just on my recollection of the the cohort um, statistics. Interesting. And so and the basic mechanism is that rapamycin uh, uh, may help with this, you know, low chronic age-related inflammation and so help with with many age-related uh, symptoms? I, I mean, I think that's the thing I would point to as the most obvious uh, effect that rapamycin has. So it is a, it is a, I mean, it's used as an organ transplant drug. It definitely has anti-inflammatory properties. And through mechanisms I don't completely understand, seems to be particularly effective against the type of inflammation that we see goes up with age. And what I mean by that is chronic sterile inflammation. Um, uh, but rapamycin also increases autophagy, um, 
improves mitochondrial function, affects protein synthesis, generally reduces protein synthesis, which is kind of interesting. So there's a lot of different things that rapamycin does that has been implicated in laboratory studies in the lifespan benefits. It's not completely clear how all of these different downstream effects interact and which are most important for health span versus lifespan or, or changes in different tissues that we see. That's very interesting. But uh, I think uh, inflammaging, this concept of integrated yeah. inflammation is probably related to all aging mechanisms. And so probably it makes sense that if it's uh, hitting different um, mechanisms, probably it's going to impact inflammaging as a whole. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. So one related question is uh, uh, Dr. Alan Green, uh, who has uh, used uh, rapamycin for many years, uh, recently passed away. Uh, yeah. Is there any connection to uh, the rap rapamycin use? Well, I mean, I think the honest answer is it's impossible to know. So, so, yeah. so to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, and in Alan's case, I mean, first of all, it's worth saying Alan, you know, was in many ways ahead of his time. So he recognized the possibility that rapamycin could have potential benefits for lots of people, I think, before most, certainly before most practicing physicians did, because still, I don't think most practicing phys physicians um, have even really thought about rapamycin before it became it at all mainstream. So he was really the first, I think, to start prescribing rapamycin for his patients in people who he thought would, would benefit. Alan, it's my understanding, Alan first started taking rapamycin because he was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so a, a, a specific type of heart disease. Um, and he, based on his understanding of the literature, thought that rapamycin might help him in his specific case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And again, my understanding from talking to him is that it did. So, you know, one way to look at that is it's quite possible that Alan got five, 10 extra years of life based on taking rapamycin. I actually, I don't know the details of, um, of his passing. So I, I really have no information on, is, it, is there any reason to believe that rapamycin had any, any role there? Yeah, that, I think this is also the most likely explanation. Um, yeah, so and before we move on, um, the dosing, my understanding is six to 10 milligrams. I mean, people, different people are yeah. using different doses probably, but what's, uh, what's the most typical dose for healthy aging? Right, so we published a study last year where we collected data from, from more than 300 people who'd been using rapamycin off-label for potential health span um, purposes. The most common dose was six milligrams once a week. As I, as I alluded to earlier, there's a pretty wide variation around that. So it's more or less normally distributed with a few outliers at the high end. Um, but that's the most common dose. And I think, again, that is largely because uh, in, the, in the population who've been using rapamycin off-label for a few years, many of those people were prescribed rapamycin by Alan Green, and that was the dose that he most often prescribed. Where that dose exactly came from, um, I think is a little bit unclear, but, but I would speculate that it is largely derived from work that Joan Manick did when she did was looking at the effect of a derivative of rapamycin called Everolimus, and it was a clinical trial. They published a series of clinical trials looking at the effects on vaccine response. So they gave healthy older people either a placebo or Everolimus for six weeks and then looked at their response to a flu vaccine. And they tested three doses. They tested, uh, I think, one milligram every day, five milligrams once a week, or 20 milligrams once a week. And what they saw was they got the best efficacy and essentially no side effects at the five milligrams once a week. And so I think that's at least part of why rapamycin started being prescribed off-label at this six milligrams once a week. And there's scientific speculation around some potential benefits to doing once a week versus daily. Happy to talk about that if you'd like. But I think it really was Jones' study that added some evidence that once weekly dosing with an mTOR inhibitor like rapamycin could give you efficacy and seemed to reduce the risk of side effects. Now, the side effects were all really minor, again, things like mouth sores, um, but the people in the five milligrams once a week group really had no difference from placebo in terms of um, frequency of side effects. Thank you, thank you. 
Okay, let's move to regenerative medicine approaches. So, um, I know, no, be, uh, no, before that, the last uh, question, estrogen therapy, yeah. both for women and men. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, what, what do you think? And what, yeah. is it a promising intervention? Sure. So again, we have to separate what we know from animal studies from what we know from human studies. So in the reason why I think we would even talk about this in men is that there have been studies from the NIH interventions testing program, which tests different drugs in mice, showing that a couple of different estrogens, so 17 alpha estradiol and I think estriol, um, both in mice have been shown to increase lifespan, specifically in male mice, and very little, to, if any, effect in female mice. In humans, the situation, obviously, the information we have is different because there are very few men who have been on estrogen therapy. But there is evidence from the UK Biobank that women taking different estrogens have lower all-cause mortality than women who never took estrogens. And presumably, most of those women are taking either birth control or um, hormone replacement therapy. So I would say, I think that you can, we can put this into two, two buckets. There's hormone replacement therapy for um, perimenopausal or menopausal women. And then there's, would you take estradiol, estriol, something else for longevity purposes? The mechanisms may be related, they may not. My personal view is that the hormone replacement therapy for women, for many women has huge benefits. And I think, wrongly got a bad reputation that is still being sort of worked out among the medical community. So I'm not saying it's for everybody, but I think it's a conversation that, that every woman should have with their provider, perimenopause, menopause. Longevity, I think we still don't know, but the, inf the, the data we've got is really interesting. The fact that it came out of the interventions testing program in mice and the data from the UK biobank suggests lower all-cause mortality in humans. Again, those are gonna be women is intriguing. Am I on estrogen therapy? No, I'm not. So I'm not like ready to say men should go out and start taking estrogen for longevity purposes. I would say it's intriguing and I really would like to, to understand better what the mechanisms might be there. Um, and it's the kind of thing where if we could understand the mechanisms, we could potentially in a targeted way predict which people might get benefits and, and who might not get benefits. That's interesting. And so, so far the, the, the best candidates are estriol for women and 17 alpha estradiol um, those of what those of what have been shown to increase lifespan in mice i'd have to go back to the the paper um my recollection was there were there were three or four different estrogens in the uk biobank data that were associated with lower all-cause mortality which again starts to paint a picture that this is a real signal right if you only saw one you might be like okay maybe it's real maybe it's not when you start seeing three or four all come out with a with a, a lower all-cause mortality that starts to present, you know, it, it's, it's a real signal. It is worth saying, as with any of these human studies, you have to be careful not to infer causality. There may be things about that population independent of the fact that they were on estrogen therapy that led to lower all-cause mortality. But like I said, the fact that the mouse data is showing you one thing, the human data is showing you the same thing, it's it's intriguing and and, and starts to paint an interesting picture. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's move to regenerative medicine. Stem cells, peptides, exosomes, and PRP. Which of these yeah. interventions has the most, is the most promising? Which, which one needs more evidence? I think they're all promising and all need more evidence. <laughs> so yeah. um, I don't know which has the most, right? I, and, and, and so there's a, a couple things I would say. I mean, I think um, peptides, well, really all of these things, but, but peptides in, in particular, they're just biologically active molecules, right? They're, they're really in some ways no different than a, a small molecule like rapamycin. You, they get in your body and they can usually signal and they're affecting you know, biological pathways. So I think you still need to be specific about which peptides you're talking about and which pathways you're trying to target, just like you do with small molecules. Um, uh, having said that, um, I mean, I think they all have promise. There are certain specific peptides that are really interesting. Stem cells, obviously, there's no question. Stem cell therapies can have potent beneficial effects in certain contexts. And we've seen this in mice. There's plenty of anecdotal data in people. There's, there's even you know published data in humans for certain uses of stem cells. 
one of the challenges, at least for me, with stem cells is the lack of regulation around how this is being used clinically, you know, makes it hard to draw strong conclusions, you know, which type of stem cells, which conditions, how are they being delivered? How do you even know the quality of the product that you're getting and putting into your body? I mean, I think those are all questions that make it hard for me to have a lot of confidence that I would use a certain stem cell procedure from a certain provider in a certain way because we don't have that regulation. And, you know, we could have a whole conversation about appropriate regulation in this space, but I do think a lack of regulation leads to a lack of certainty around quality control in the way that, that, that things are produced and the way that they are used clinically, which makes it hard for me personally to have a ton of confidence. And I would, I would also put exosomes in that same bucket, at least the way that they're being used clinically right now. Again, exosomes are just a, a, a complex mixture of different bioactive components, right? So can they have potent biological activity? Absolutely. Can certain exosome preparations have regenerative properties? Absolutely. Um, which ones, when, how? I think it's it's really early and I don't think we have a lot of quality data at this point. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the, very much for that. So now essential blood markers to track for aging. Yeah. <laughs> are you asking what are they? <laughs> yes, what are they for yeah. you like starting, yeah. Well, so I, again, I would put this in two buckets. I think there's there's biomarkers for health and health span. Those may or may not be the same as biomarkers that reflect biological aging, right? And this is where I think maybe definitionally there's a lot of confusion because I think a lot of people are using health and biological aging interchangeably. So anything that improves health reverses biological aging, but it becomes this very circular argument. And so I, I tend to try to think about those as different things. So I think health, we know a lot from, you know, decades of clinical practice about the types of biomarkers that tell us something about current health status and future health risk, right? So glucose, insulin for metabolic function, A1C, you'd probably put in that bucket, lipids for cardiovascular function, um, hormones we've talked about. I think hormones are underappreciated, super important. Uh, those are all I would put under the things we should be looking at in adults to get a feel for where are they in their health span journey? What's your current health status? Where can we move the needle? I'd also put, you know, the vitamin deficiencies we talked about, metal toxicities that can be measured. Are you being exposed to things in your environment that can create problems? Inflammatory markers, that's a big bucket. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there to understand which inflammatory markers are informative and which aren't, but we've already talked about the importance of inflammation. So, so at Optispan, we're looking at a bunch of inflammatory markers with the goal of trying to figure out which are most informative for individuals about where they're at and targeted therapy. So some things that aren't commonly looked at um, related to different types of autoimmune dysfunction, things like that. But I put inflammation in, in one big bucket. So those are all things that are in the, the, the standard, you know, clinical chemistry sort of bucket. You go to LabCorp, you can go to Quest, these diagnostic laboratories, get these things measured. And if you have a healthcare provider who understands the space, they can use that information to help you figure out, you know, where you're at and maybe what are some of the things that you should you should be doing going forward and also detect pre-existing disease. Are those biological aging? I'm sure they tell us something about biological aging, but I don't feel confident that I can point to a subset of them and give you your biological age just based on those blood-based biomarkers. And then there when, are, sorry, ahead. when and how often should we start tracking those markers? Yeah, I mean, again, I think obviously some of this is is dependent on cost, right? So you could you can you can go through a list of different diagnostics, you know, where you could spend fifteen thousand dollars a year if you wanted to, twenty thousand dollars a year on diagnostics. Really, I think depends on your, you know, financial state and you know what is your appetite for trying to measure as many things as you can. I would say optimally, um, you know, the basic blood biomarkers that you're going to get from your primary care physician are insufficient in most cases, certainly in people, once you get into your 40s, 50s, I would say are insufficient. I would say almost everybody could benefit from an essential vitamin and nutrient panel because so many people are deficient. Um, hormones, I again, I'm not an MD, I should put that out there. So this is my opinion um, based on, you know, 
information that I've that I've taken in. Uh, I think most people probably. It's interesting. I actually just had a conversation with a with a doc who specializes in hormones, and she was saying for women, as early as 35 is not a bad idea to start getting a comprehensive hormone panel so that you kind of know what your baseline is going into the, the years, the perimenopause years. So that's probably not a bad idea for men as well. I, I certainly wish I knew what my hormones looked like when I was 35. So I'm 53 now. I really didn't start paying any attention to this stuff till I was around 50. So I wish I had that information. Um, so I think that's probably a good time. Now, do you need to do it every year at that point? Probably not. Maybe once every few years. And then when you get in your 50s, I think the hormones become really important. And a lot of people have undiagnosed hormone imbalances. And this the hormone space, I know I'm getting off on a tangent a little bit, but I think this is important. The hormone space is a mess because you've got a bunch of a bunch of providers out there who, especially in men, who will just prescribe tea to anybody. They don't even yeah. measure anything, right? <laughs> and then you have a bunch of men who never pay any attention to it, who probably could benefit from hormone therapy, who never get tested, right? So I think these are the kinds of things where we have the tools to measure it. We know what to look for. We know how to interpret it. We should just be measuring it in everybody. And then for the people who need it, and I'm not telling, I'm not suggesting that with hormones, the measurements are everything because symptomology is important as well, obviously. But in the absence of measuring, we should not be treating, in my view. So I would suggest that hormones are something that pretty much everybody in their 50s should have done, figure out where you're at. And I think a lot of people could benefit from that. Yeah, I agree. Especially, I think, with testosterone, I think uh, understanding your baseline, even before 50 years yeah. of age, is very important because may maybe you have always had, you know, your, your the, I, my understanding is the baseline of testosterone really varies uh, across yeah. individuals. Hugely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's very important. And I'm also a fan of these functional markers. You were, you were mentioning these bi bi biological aging markers. Uh, although I'm, I'm myself involved in, in research, especially with the epigenetic clocks. Yeah. And I find yeah. them find them very promising from a scientific point as a scientific tool. I I'm not convinced about about their their uh, clinical utility. Um, we recently published um, uh, an article that was featured on a Netflix documentary. Uh, was a, a vegan study using epigenetic clock. Uh, but um, the the uh, what I see that these epigenetic clocks, especially, they tend to correlate with um, you know, usually, uh, if uh, uh, the, the the study population is uh, losing weight, yeah, the the, uh, the epigenetic clock will improve and show biological rejuvenation, uh, just because all the the, the way of uh, how these uh, these epigenetic clocks are trained, all the the bi the biomarkers that are trained on uh, triglycerides, insulin, move in the right direction when people lose weight, but. Um, this doesn't. Uh, I, uh, this doesn't mean that, for example, if you are a frail individual and you are losing weight and sure. you are rejuvenating bio epigenetically, that this is a, this is actually meaning you are being healthier. You are going to be healthier right. and live longer. And you right. should be keep it doing this. So this is where I think the science and the practical application are really. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I would I would agree with that. I think also it's worth. So I would agree completely. These are fantastic research tools, and I think we will get to the point where they are much more useful than they are today in clinical practice. But then there's the whole direct to consumer market, which is again we talk about lack of regulation. We really don't know anything about the quality control, the precision, the accuracy of these tests that are being sold to people. Um, I've actually done a, a personal experiment testing a bunch of different companies. I'll just tell you, it's all over the map. So same day, same blood sample sent to different companies. So that's a different question around what, are, what's, what are these things actually telling you when you're going out and getting them tested, you know, on the consumer market. The other thing I'll say, and this is where I don't really know how much the epigenetic clocks are reflecting of biological aging as a whole. It's a part of biological aging for sure, but they go up and down like crazy. Right. So you can, in a three month period, see a decade change in your epigenetic age. Right. And so the question I've got is, is if that is, let's just say that is reflecting biological age. Right. We'll just accept that question. Let's just say it is. If it is, 
does that mean that you, in a 10 year or a three month period, you aged at 300 times the rate of aging or in reverse at 300 times the rate of aging? <laughs> if, if it does mean that, then that means we fundamentally misunderstand what biological aging is at all, right? That means biological aging is way more plastic. It's going up and down like crazy. I actually think, sorry, again, a tangent, but I actually, I've been thinking about this. I actually think biological aging is probably at least it's multi-component. So there's a component that goes up with chronological age. Maybe it's exponential, maybe it's linear. And then you've got this other component that's fluctuating around that. Maybe that's resilience, right? Maybe that's what the epigenetic tests are measuring. And they're not getting this, this component. So that's all speculation. But I do think people need to appreciate if these things are showing a decade difference in whatever number they're giving you in a three month period, that's very different than the way we understand or have thought about the aging process previously. Maybe it's real, maybe it's not, but it's unexpected. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I agree with your, uh, with your, uh... Uh, we, we will just say it. Um, so let's end now with the uh, uh, longevity lightning round. So okay. I will name <laughs> I will name a series of supplements and interventions, and you will rate them based uh, on uh, a traffic light rating system. So okay. um, let me pull this. You're going to get me in trouble here. Uh, <laughs> No, no worries. Uh, so, uh, so we will. Um, so green for promising evidence, worth considering, or uh, uh, yellow for limited evidence, proceed with caution, and red for no evidence, save your money. Okay. So well, okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Now this is where my this is where my my scientific mind you know has to has to question. So. <laughs> I'm hesitant to, to choose red because there's there's very little that has no evidence. So I'm just going to go with the save your money. So if I think it's not worth your money, I'm going to I'm going to put that. In the, actually, that would be yellow too. So this is where it gets complicated, right? Um, yeah, okay. it's, it's difficult. Also, when I was making up these categories, I understand yeah. that three is not enough. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, Let's uh, give it a but, shot. Yeah, you can you can comment, but I'll okay. keep your answer to 30 seconds maximum. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, uh, let's start with the foundational supplements, uh, creatine. Yeah, I mean, I put I put creatine in the green. Although personally, I've stopped taking creatine recently. Um, I also would say it's not a it's not going to move the needle if you're not doing other stuff on its on its own. But I think there's plenty of plenty of reason for safety, and uh, many many people in the industry believe that it works. So there's some reason to believe it probably helps. Okay. Collagen. I put that in the same bucket, green. Okay, but, green. But again, it's not gonna have a huge effect on its own. Okay. Then um, CoQ10. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't, uh. I don't know. I don't. I don't have a strong opinion. Um, I, I, I put it in yellow, but not okay. not strongly strongly uh, feeling about that. Okay, glycine and neck. The combination. Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, this would be somewhere between yellow and green for me. Intriguing. I think we need more data, but but the data I've seen looks pretty interesting. Okay, yellow or green. Yes, I also <laughs> like it. I'm experimenting with it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if you're putting in things in green that like you might want to experiment and see if it makes you feel better, sure. That that's yeah, it. I didn't feel anything, but I'm com I mean, the mechanism sounds interesting. Uh, taurine. Yeah, again, I'd probably put that in the yellow, somewhere between yellow and green. Um, although maybe closer to yellow than glynac. Although I, you know, I should say I'm a I'm an author on the science paper where all of these things that taurine did in different animals for lifespan. Okay. Uh, so it's not that I'm against taurine. I just, it's a little early and we haven't seen enough replicability across different systems yet, but not going to hurt I, anybody most likely. NAD boosters. Uh, I mean, I put that again between yellow and green with the added uh, piece that, you know, there's nicotinamid riboside, nicotinamid mononucleotide, expensive. There's niacin cheap. They all essentially do the same thing. So, you know, it's very unlikely in my mind that NR or NMN are going to do anything that you can't get from, from niacin. They all boost NAD. Just a question. Niacinamide 
which is recommended by some skin yeah. experts is yeah. different, right? Or is well, they all can boost NAD if you can get bioavailability, right? So okay. my understanding is that all of these in the gut microbiome get broken down to nicotinamide or niacin and then get taken up that way. Now, people will argue about it, but essentially they can all boost NAD. I think the question is in which people and where is boosting NAD valuable? The one circular way you can bypass that is to do NAD uh, by IV, right? Which I know some people do. I've never done it. I'm kind of curious. I want to. I'd like to try it and see if it see what how I feel. I know it doesn't but feel I think, good. <laughs> oh really? Okay. <laughs> but I but, uh, but I would the say during the process, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, but yeah. I, I think it's still a question though. Is boosting NID fundamentally beneficial for most people? For some people, sure, no question about it. For most people, I think we don't know. Okay. Uralitin A. Yeah, I'm intrigued by urolithin A. I, again, somewhere between yellow and green, but you know, it's kind of like Glynac. I think the data that's out there, especially the animal data, is pretty good, and the small but limited human data is, also looks pretty intriguing. Okay, good. Uh, spermidin. Yeah, it's same as urolithin A, but a little bit less evidence in my mind in humans. Um, but again, it's a, you find it in your diet. It's a, it's a group, it's part of a group of molecules called polyamines. There is evidence that people who consume more polyamines, you know, have, are, are associated with lower risk for, for multiple different conditions. So not going to hurt you. Is it bioavailable? Is it helpful? Less clear. Alpha ketoglutarate. God, these are all kind of landing in the same spot. I, again, yeah. would put that kind of in the same bucket with urolithin A. The data that's out there is intriguing. It did not replicate in the NIA interventions testing program in mice for lifespan. But I think even in the original study, the health span data was more compelling than the lifespan data. Plus, uh, one of my really, really good friends and long-term collaborators, Brian Kennedy, did the work on alpha ketoglutarate. I trust him. He's a great scientist. So I believe it. Okay. Metformin and berberine. Yeah, so it, uh, it's, it's interesting you put these two together because they probably function more or less the same way. Um, in people who have metabolic dysfunction, sorry, I know I'm not giving you the color, yellow, sure. Um, in people who have metabolic dysfunction, uh, absolutely. In people who don't have metabolic dysfunction, I'm not personally a fan of metformin or berberine because I think there are some, some reasons to be wary of side effects that have been unappreciated till date. To this day okay yeah makes sense uh peptides it's, it's too big a bucket i mean yeah it's like yeah. it's like drugs <laughs> yeah, um i think it depends a, on this i think it depends, it depends. on the peptide yeah. it depends it, it can yeah that's uh leave it that way um stem cells yeah again i'd be careful uh, for the reasons that we already talked about do i believe that for some people some stem cell therapies absolutely have potent benefits absolutely but we, it's often hard to know that you're, unless you know that you're with a credible clinic, somebody who has a ton of expertise and that the quality of what they're producing and going to put in you is high quality, I'd be careful. Okay, PRP. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a, I don't know enough to really comment on PRP. Yeah. Um, I've had some conversations, but I have no firsthand experience and I haven't really done a, a deep dive. It's in it's in my list of things that I want to look more into. Okay. So I'm going to pass on PRP. Exosomes. Yeah, I'd be uh, yellow. I mean, again, yellow, red. I don't know, yeah. but um, again, I think it's too early for people to start doing this in most cases, uh, but certainly high potential. Okay, hyperbaric oxygen. This is one that's I don't know. I'm I'm intrigued again. Um, uh, so. I have been very skeptical of hyperbaric oxygen. I've never done it. Uh, um, I, I guess I'd put it in the yellow just because I don't, I don't, I, I, I think the data that I keep seeing is interesting. I haven't seen anything that makes me convinced, but I know a lot of people, you know, are, are very convinced. And so maybe, I don't know. Okay. Now, bioacker favorites, cold exposure. Uh, I mean, also in the yellow, I would say. So again, for some people, no doubt, I know lots of people, maybe not lots, I know some people who tell me, who swear by it, like they feel so much better, their inflammation goes down. I think you can also ask, is this different from cold exposure combined with sauna, right? So that the, the, the two combined, that I, I, 
I don't have a I don't have enough data to to comment on whether you should combine them. You should do one. You should do the other. Yeah. So that's your next one. My personal yeah. experience. So I did my first sauna sauna ice bath um, a couple of months ago. I felt great. Does that mean anything? I don't know. <laughs> but I do think for some people, uh, it can absolutely have mood enhancing and probably anti-inflammatory uh, effects that are that are valuable. Again, would I do that at the expense of exercise and nutrition? No. Focus on the things that you know are going to move the needle before you yeah. start worrying about this stuff. That's exactly what I think. And personally, I tried cold exposures, but I don't enjoy it. And I believe that pleasure needs yeah. to be part of the process. Otherwise, you don't stick to the intervention. And so so, and also, what's the point of having a miserable life? So I, yeah. I quit with cold exposure. It's Sorry interesting, though. I mean, I think, I think, I think the the counter argument to that, and some people will put it this way, is that it actually doing something that you don't enjoy is sort of building your stress resistance and your your sense of you know personal achievement, right? So again, it's it's going to be very individual. Yeah, but I think I some understand. people really it it increases their confidence that they can do this thing that's really sucks once a day you know, for three minutes that's, or whatever. Yeah, and I completely relate. I mean, I, I, I train very hard and I like the most painful exercises. Yeah. And I need yeah. to do that. So I have my pain zone that I actually enjoy that pain, but the cold, yeah. no. So I, I, I agree Got with it. you. It depends. Pick, pick your battles, basically. Um, uh, and then finally, just let's end with the, with your, what is in your longevity toolkit? Yeah. So first of all, I would say it's evolving, right? I think everybody's should be evolving as you learn more and you figure out what works for you. So what I, what I do, um, to really focus on is, is, and what I've made, you know, pretty significant changes in the last few years is diet quality. So really trying to remove as much of the processed foods as possible. Um, focus on, you know, lots of vegetables in particular. I eat meat. I like meat. So I'm not somebody who says don't ever eat meat, but, you know, don't overdo it on the meat would be my, especially red meat would be my uh, recommendation, uh, but really quality. And then I don't have to worry so much about quantity if I'm eating a high quality diet. So I eat till I'm full and it's not a big deal. Exercise regularly, uh, definitely do resistance training at least a few times a week and then sprinkle in other types of exercise. I think like you were just suggesting, exercise that you enjoy is really important if you're going to stay with it. So I enjoy lifting weights. I also enjoy hiking. So I try to get some hiking in um, with my wife, you know, once a week if we can. So exercise for sure. Uh, sleep quality. Again, I've been fortunate that I uh, sleep pretty well. So I haven't had to do a lot around sleep hygiene. I know some people really struggle with that. So that hasn't been something that I've had to prioritize, but I, I have and still do sometimes track my sleep to oh. just to see where I'm at. Um, connection, I think, is the one where I still have the most work to do. And this is an area that I've been working on myself uh, quite a bit. So, you know, trying to make sure that not so much my personal mindfulness, but my relationships. I think, you know, this is a generalization for sure, but middle-aged men, generally are the ones who really struggle with connection and, and personal relationships um, often. So this is something personally that I'm focused on and continue to focus on. Outside of the pillars, um, you know, I don't take a lot of supplements. So I do take uh, uh, omega-3, a vitamin D and a multi. The multi is, I, you know, I'm not convinced multis have a ton of value, more like an insurance policy. Yeah. Uh, magnesium, I, 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 I usually take magnesium. I'm not 100% convinced, but enough people who I, who's, who, who I respect say that we should all take magnesium. So it's hard to measure, so it's hard to know. Um, outside of that, I don't take a whole lot for supplements. Uh, um, I mentioned I stopped taking creatine uh, recently, not for any particular reason. I just, I just decided to take it out and see if, it, see if I noticed anything. I do take rapamycin periodically. I cycle rapamycin uh, usually in 10 or 12 week cycles, once every three to six months. Thank you very much for your time, Matt. It's, sure. uh, it's been a, a great interview. Where can people learn more about you and connect with you online? Yeah, so I'm on a bunch of different social media platforms, but the best place is to check out the Optispan podcast on YouTube. So it's YouTube slash Optispan or at Optispan. Um, so we try to put out, you know, a pretty wide variety of, of content related to the science of longevity, but also stuff like this where we talk about 
practical applications that, that people can use. Um, so hopefully people will check that out and enjoy it. Oh, yes. I am a subscriber and I love the podcast. If you are Thank looking you. for evidence-based information on health and longevity, this is the place to go. Appreciate uh, it. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for being with us today. Thank Absolutely. You. My pleasure.